With freshwater ecosystems at risk from habitat destruction, urban development and pollution, decision makers are aware of the importance of having community members take part in efforts to conserve and protect waterways. The benefits can go both ways. Volunteers that make waterways more attractive develop social connections and skills, and in doing so, make those waterways more attractive for more members of the community to enjoy the benefits of spending time in nature. Waterways across Melbourne are managed by Melbourne Water. They have a 10-year plan called the Healthy Waterway Strategy, which is designed to attract community members to Melbourne's waterways in order to spend time in nature. Our researchers worked with Melbourne Water to identify and prioritise behaviours that community members could do to enhance and protect our waterways. So it could be things like reducing waste, uh, reducing pollution, picking up dog poo, dog waste, reducing household chemicals and garden products, uh, volunteering, planting trees, revegetation, and things like installing rain gardens to capture runoff. With so many behaviours to choose from, if we just gave people a great long laundry list of potential behaviours, they'd completely disengage, we overwhelm them. And councils and other government organisations have also got limited resources, so we need to try to prioritise the behaviours so that governments can spend their resources more effectively and get more bang for buck. We started with four broad behavioural categories that Melbourne Water were interested in. Prevent litter, look after waterways, protect stormwater systems and get involved. We facilitated a workshop with waterway experts that generated a list of 31 potential behaviours that could have a positive impact on waterway health. We mapped these behaviours onto an impact likelihood matrix which showed three key things. The potential impact of those behaviours, how often community members are doing those behaviours now and how likely they would be to do those behaviours in the future. The impact likelihood matrix has four quadrants showing the behaviours and where they fit in. Preventing litter, looking after waterways, protecting stormwater infrastructure and getting involved. And so when we start looking at the top right hand quadrant, these are the behaviours that are very high impact and very high likelihood, so they're most likely to be adopted. These are potentially the low hanging fruit of where we might want to direct interventions in the first place. Things like reporting behaviours, so reporting pollution or reporting sediment to the EPA, preventing litter and also uh, picking up litter where it's found on waterways or in waterways. When we look at the upper left quadrant, we can see behaviours that will have a big impact on waterway health, but are maybe a bit harder to implement, so they're actually less likely to happen. And this is often because they're more expensive, they take more money, more effort, more time. Things like landholders installing fences along waterways and having watering stations for their stock in paddocks so they don't have to go into waterways. And things like community members joining conservation volunteering groups or creating rain gardens to catch runoff or disposing of paints and chemicals in uh, the government take back schemes so they don't end up polluting waterways. So when we look at the bottom right quadrant, these are behaviours that are easy to do, but they don't necessarily have a very big impact on waterway health. And so these are the kind of simple and painless things that people may actually already be doing, like staying on the path when they're walking along waterways, picking up dog poo, uh, or washing your cars or lawns on nature strips. So when we look at the bottom left quadrant, the final quadrant, these are the behaviours that will have not much impact on uh, waterway health as well as not very likely to be adopted, like uh, stormwater protection behaviours such as uh, people checking their pipes for any leaks, preventing litter by taking cigarette butts home or requesting council to install additional bins. These are behaviours that take a lot of effort but not much reward. When you add in the proportion of people already doing these things, it's clear that the behaviours that require less effort are more popular because they're so much easier. So if we look at the size of the circle, you can see the bigger the circle, the more people that are already doing that behaviour. And so if we want to encourage more people to do it, we might look at the behaviours that have a smaller circle because we can have an impact just by simply getting more people to do that behaviour. Education programs are often not enough by themselves. Community volunteering environmental programs are not just driven by altruism, they can develop relationships and skills and social interactions. So programs that leverage these drivers may encourage more environmental volunteers. We have an example of one in Melbourne's northeast where a local group is based around a lovable Australian animal and organises regular events to protect and enhance riparian zones along the Yarra River. So when we're considering drivers and barriers of a behaviour, one of the things to think about is the context. 
So two of the behaviours we found uh, that were high impact but low likelihood were landholders installing fencing uh, to protect riparian areas, as well as uh, watering stations for their stock so that they didn't damage creeks and waterways as they were drinking. But the biggest barriers to these may be something like they're expensive or they don't have the time or they don't have the resources. And so we need to potentially provide these resources and time uh, for landholders to actually do these behaviours. While we do need more research to identify the drivers and barriers of these behaviours, these findings can help inform policies and programs to encourage volunteers who want to get involved in protecting and enhancing Melbourne's waterways.